Do you worry about the future or are you stuck in the past? Like either or, you got problems with it now, we got solutions. We've got Rabbi Rietti. He is an author, he's an educator, he's a brilliant teacher and he's funny and unbelievable. You're gonna have the best time. Today, we're gonna talk about how to deal with t- today, like now. Start getting your questions ready. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you in a minute. We are so lucky. We have the educator. He's a consultant. He's a teacher. He's written a gazillion books. He's put out, I think it's hundreds. It might be thousands of audio tapes. He's just such a special individual. We're very lucky to have him. Rabbi Rietti, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you, Leah, for having me. Thank you so much. So we go right in very fast. So I'm going to ask you the million dollar question, which is, okay, living in the now. It's like, yeah, yeah, actually I want one of those. Yeah, I'll I'll take that. Amazon Prime. Let's get it right. Living in the now. So, but the question is, what does living in the now mean? What does it even mean to live in the now? Excellent question. Um, I'll respond with an anecdote. Uh, There was a famous rabbi, Nachman of Breslov. He lived about 200 years ago. And uh, after he passed away, his student was asked, what was the greatest thing your rabbi rabbi ever did? And he immediately responded with no uh, resistance or having to think about it. He said, the greatest thing my rabbi ever did was whatever he was doing in that moment. So when we say living in the now, what we're really talking about is thought. Where's my mind? If I'm at work, but I'm worried about my spouse and kids, so where am I? Well, I'm geographically in my workplace, but am I focusing on the project at hand or even the phone call? So really, um, living in the now is really all about, oh, I'm at work, that's where my focus is. Oh, I'm having a discussion with my wife. Oh, so if I'm I'm in the middle of time out with my wife, then why would I be, oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, Why would I get distracted with, oh, because my mind went somewhere else. So living in the now is, this is where I am geographically, and these are people who are in my life right this moment. I'm doing homework with my kid right now. Oh, I'm playing table tennis with my child or ping pong. Um, I'm now taking a shower. I'm going to sleep. Sleeping time is not for me to be worrying about tomorrow or last night or the rest of the day. Living in the now is, oh, I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep. So we're talking really about where our mind is and doing the best I can in that moment. So I hear that, but two questions. One is, that seems impossible, okay? Uh, that other people have told me that it's impossible. Me, no problem. Okay. But the second thing is, is how does that differ? Like, isn't that, wait, aren't we supposed to multitask? Like, how do you get through a day without doing 14 things at once? I don't quite understand how that's possible. And <laughs> Leia, Leia, can I add something to yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. It, it's, Rabbi Rietti, it's a, such an amazing, sounds like such a great concept. But at the same token, it sounds like it's not possible for a woman to do because a woman's mind never shuts off. No human being in history's mind ever shut off. That, so you're correct. That's actually impossible. From uh, the moment of conception, your brain and your heart are microscopic. And in the next 40 days, actually creates your entire skeletal system and your muscular system and your respiratory system, uh, your nervous system. Every single part of your entire physical body is created by your mind, which is working ferociously. You may not have vocabulary yet because in the first two years after you're born, you're gathering in information, words, and associating those words to images. So you, you need two years in the first two years of your life for your mind to actually be absorbing all this information. Your mind is always busy. It never stops thinking. Even when you're asleep, your mind is dreaming or you're not aware of it, but you can see on on monitors how the the brain is actually still active. So you're 100% correct. There's no such thing as your mind stopping. What we are talking about is, what what is my focus right now? Am I, oh, I'm writing an exam. I'll give you, and to say it's impossible, that's just an innocent misunderstanding of reality. Have you ever been kicked in the shin really hard? Ow, and you're 20 minutes before the end of a game and you're playing hockey, or in my case, soccer or American football, and it really hurts. And you carry on running. 
for 20 minutes until the referee blows the whistle. And all of a sudden, now I'm limping off the pitch. Uh, excuse me, Rieti, we've got this on video. You got kicked 20 minutes ago, so don't pretend now you're in pain. And the answer is, where was my mind for the past 20 minutes? My mind actually said, shut up, pain. That's an English expression for be quiet. Um, this, is, this is the championships. Um, I'm going for MVP, uh, the semifinals. Um, I'm in the middle of the game, so keep quiet pain. I'll deal with you later. We do this all the time. We have an amazing power to even shut out physical pain. That's how powerful the mind is when it comes to focus. So the question really is, how engaged am I? So I do agree with you that we are living in a generation where our minds are being so bombarded, literally, possibly by every minute, especially on these devices, because what ends up happening is that my mind is being trained not to pay attention to anything wow. more than 5, 10, 20 seconds. You go to the vast majority of preschools and there's, there's music and there's pictures on all the walls and there's lots of things happening. We're, it's all, I'm not saying a conspiracy here, I'm describing an observation. We are almost literally training the mind of young children and later on with commercials and certainly movies where you've got up to five cameras in the actual movie where it's taking from different angles at the same time. It's only in the editing stage that you have one focus of one camera at a time. But actually what's really happening is that the viewer watching the movie, his mind is being switched from one screen to another screen to another screen and never gets a chance to focus for more than a few seconds at a time. So actually our minds are literally being trained to be constantly bombarded, not to pay attention for more than a few seconds. Wow, wow, wow. This, is, this, is pro this seems like it's a problem. I'm not sure what the problem is and what the ramifications are, but it seems like, whoa, what are the problems? <laughs> what are the yeah, problems? no, I also lay our cell phones, meaning we're so used to being constantly on all the time and being distracted and by a phone. Different I don't apps know, and the go email back. and the text and go, yeah, to, oh, I don't I think it's go my... back to like another time. <laughs> we are under the illusion that the more things I'm darting between, the more efficient I am. And there's an industry behind multitasking. Um, I, I, my personal background is in, in advertising. I worked with my father, uh, who was the, uh, the best in the world in the film industry in dubbing. That's revoicing -vo movies. Um, he did all the old Bond movies with um, Sean Connery, Roger Moore. He was the director of all the voiceovers of every single one of the, of the Bond movies. But he employed me many times to work in commercials. Um, and in the world of commercials and in the world of movies, um, I'm, again, I'm not going to call this a conspiracy, but this was a plan. This was designed. And the design essentially is um, we want to be able to sell anybody anything that we want to sell, whether it's a message in a movie or it's just an entertainment value or it's a political message or if it's a commercial, hey, we want to sell a product or service and we've only got seconds to convince your mind to go for it. So in that world, it happens to be wow. that there's, there is a deliberate and successful attempt to train the minds of children at a very young age so that by the time they become consumers, they're not aware at all that what they have associated their well-being and their happiness and pleasure and meaning and everything that the human soul craves for has been associated to products and services. How I look, which brand I'm wearing, uh, which wow. cigarette brand I'm smoking, uh, which drink I'm drinking, uh, which car I'm driving, which vacation I'm going on. And, and, and I'm being bombarded with higher and higher standards of luxury. When I was a kid, anybody who flew frequently was called a globetrotter, and that was the privilege of the wealthy. But after, credit cards became a reality in this world, uh, people were able to buy things with money they don't have. <laughs> and things they don't need to impress people they don't even like. <laughs> so, uh, we, we, have, we have several generations. Yes. 
where the world of advertising has had an agenda. It's not, I'm not going to call it conspiracy because it's, it's just simply how do we make a lot of money by selling products and associating those products to pleasure? Um, Michael Jackson, um, he was paid the most money ever in the advertising industry. Um, I think it was in the 70s or early 80s for a Pepsi Cola commercial, 186 seconds of his precious time, he got paid $11 million. <laughs> I would have done it for half the price. <laughs> anyway, um, Sony saw the sales of Pepsi <laughs> and they were so impressed that they signed up Michael Jackson for a 10 year contract for $2 billion. Make no mistake, the world of advertising, movies, media, are fully aware of the mechanics they are using to persuade the masses, so to speak. And part of that is, don't think too much. Because if you use your brain to critique the information, you might not buy our product or buy our political party or buy our value system. And so uh, we, we need to manipulate what you're thinking by keeping you distracted constantly. Um, and again, again, I don't mean this as a conspiracy. It's just this has been the direction that the Western culture has gone in, in, in its marriage to technology. I don't say this as a negative necessarily or a value. I'm not giving an evaluation. I'm sharing an observation. And in doing so, some of the downside is that the children are being literally dumbed down. Children's dumbed, dumbed down. Did you say dumbed? D U M B D U M B E D. Right. Okay. Dumbed down. <laughs> Listen, okay, gotcha. I didn't invent English spelling, but whoever did was learning disabled. <laughs> what's, what's being <laughs> dumbed down. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yeah. No, Rabbi Randy, they were uh, tricking the dumb people. How? How could a dumb person? How could a smart person write dumb if you don't hear the B at all? <laughs> Seriously. So, so, by the way, Rabbi, it's it. so Leah, it's so interesting because I had a friend, a really close friend of mine who um, was from Australia and she was never bought into the marketing and she was so able to like separate things above and she, it. she wanted, she was so above it. And I kept saying like, I don't get it. I get sucked into all these things. I'm a total infomercial junkie. Like I just, whatever I see, I want. So how do you do that? And she said that in Australia, um, in her school from a very young age, from like nursery, Every year they would take them to this museum, the Life Museum, and they would have different rooms. And every room was showing you how marketing affects your life. Like it would show you, you know, about smoking, about drinking, about like literally about advertising companies, everything. And it was like a whole interactive museum. And she said every year this was the school trip. So she was brought up on this. From like a little kid. In other words, like being pre, she was pre-sold that they're trying to get you. Correct. <laughs> so she was able to see it even before like. It was a thing. So I'm like, how do you now fix that when you've just been sucked in by the marketing and you're like a marketing junkie? How do you go backwards? So and I want to catch a rabbi's other thing. He said you're, they've dumbed down the nursery school kids so that they will be consumers. I think that was the, that was it's, the point you're saying. Well, there. Not only consumers, but unthinking, not critiquing what they're hearing, what they're seeing um, and what's really happening. And I've seen this literally year by year because I teach uh, 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, uh, um, almost all year round in teacher training. And the intellectual curiosity of the generation is going down, not by generation, but every single year. There used to be something called Encyclopedia um, uh, Britannica. I think um, you can still get a copy in the British Museum or Natural History Museum they may have on display there. Um, but today, we, we, you know what's so interesting? In the, in, in the first few hundred pages of Encyclopedia Britannica, hundreds of pages, you've got the profile of every contributor. And many of them have several PhDs in order for the reader to understand that this person is reliable, knowledgeable in their area of expertise. And then today, if, if I need to find something out, I go to Wikipedia. Um, hello, who are the contributors to Wikipedia? And the answer is 
anybody. So where's this information coming from? What's the reliability of it? Who taught you this information? And who taught that person this information? Where is it really coming from? So this is the generation we're living in of an incredible amount of dumbing down of intellectual curiosity. And, um, and in the Western model of education, um, children are, are not encouraged to think and ask questions. It actually, if anything, child puts his question, his arm up and says, um, oh, uh, teacher, will this be on the test? Mm, why are you asking? Well, I wanna know if I should be paying attention. <laughs> Meaning, starting one That's second awesome. after the test, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to that information? Goodbye, why? Because I'm not learning it because the learning and the information and the knowledge has any intrinsic value to me because I'm being trained by the system to learn what I need to learn for the test and starting one second after the test, download, delete, goodbye. Somewhere in the deep con uh, subconscious of my mind, but I don't need the information anymore. So the natural love for learning is also being completely diminished. I, I totally get that, but how does that relate to living in the now to us? Um, so some of you might be familiar with an educational model called Montessori. Um, Maria Montessori demonstrated over a hundred years ago with her model, and there are thousands of schools around the world that have the same model, that three to six year olds are capable, and I've seen this with my very own eyes, and I've helped facilitate a number of Jewish Montessori schools around the country and a couple uh, outside of America as well, um, Three to six year olds are capable of sitting on their own using materials for up to two hours straight, total focus. You, and I'll prove it to you. How long can your child play in the bath with uh, rubber ducks and little toy boats and, and, and uh, floats and other, <laughs> how long will they play in there? How long will your, your little child play um, standing on a stool, three, four years old, um, standing next to mom at the sink, washing dishes. How long can she do that for? And the answer is until, until it's bedtime, basically. You see, every human being starts off with the same fair advantage. We all crave to learn. We are all craving to discover. We are all craving to learn that there may be a more than one solution and I don't have to become anxiety ridden if I feel I'm stuck because I'm never stuck. And Montessori helped do this a lot. And I'll tell you something very interesting. Um, you've probably heard of um, the head of Google and the head of Wikipedia and the CEO of Amazon. So the, the um, uh, what you call it, um, the financial um, magazine that comes out of uh, Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal, oh, okay. published an article uh, where they interviewed these three COOs and the, the biggest question they wanted to get to the mechanics of was how did your mind figure out how to work so outside of the box that you came up with this idea, Amazon, Google, Wikipedia, unbeknownst to the interviewers, because each of these three COOs were interviewed in isolation of each other, they all gave the exact same answer. Wow. Oh, Montessori. You see, the Montessori system, which wow. actually, the Montessori system essentially is all about lifting the cap off the child and, and helping facilitate learning and less teaching. So it's less delivery of information than it is helping the child extrapolate from their own brilliant genius minds how to find a solution to this problem, how to add these numbers together, how to learn to spell this word. And, and it goes throughout their entire curriculum. So that is, that is something that feeds into the natural way God wired our minds to want to know more and understand what's behind this and why it works the way it does. So even though we've got the media against us, if so to speak, we've got the Western educational system, for the most part, a delivery of information against us. And uh, we've got constant devices that are distracting us. And our children are seeing role models of parents and adults constantly distracted. Uh, the very proof that we are capable 
of focus is the fact that when you walk on the street and see people looking at their phones as they're walking, as they're crossing a street, oh my gosh, as they're driving or at a red light, that means to say we are, our brain immediately goes to, oh, let me figure out what's of value in this few seconds that I've got before the red light turns green, um, while I'm waiting for the bus, for the train, while I'm waiting for uh, the phone, uh, for the person on the phone to pick up. Let me look at my iPhone or my uh, Android, whatnot. So what, what that's saying is our mind is constantly working and we just have lost the awareness of how powerful it is when we stay focused on one item and it becomes a masterpiece. And instead right. of multitasking with lots of things in the house, stay focused with this child in the time allocated for this child at supper time, lunch time. And guess what's gonna happen? You are nurturing tomorrow's generation. And the more we are investing in our children focused time, with our minds and turning off the phone, leaving it in another room. I have a very close friend, relative of mine. They have a rule, no cell phones in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. no at all times of day, the kitchen, when we, we all come, refrigerator, snack, coffee, drink, um, and, and meal times, no phones, because this is family. We belong to each other. We don't belong on, hi, oh no, you got wrong number. And what, why am I taking every distraction? because I'm not staying focused. It's not clear to me. So Rabbi is saying that the answer to all of the stuff that's being thrown, the distractions and the, all that stuff, the answer is to disengage from, from, from the phone and to focus, wait, which, both you're saying. In or, in order part, let's say you're praying. So while you're praying, turn off the phone and it's just you, the prayer book and God. Um, uh, when I'm, let's say, studying or learning for myself, turn off the phone, uh, put it on silent, um, and 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 focus on the learning, on the information, on the page that you're studying. So th there's no mystery, or you don't even have to make a science of how to live in the now because you can't not live in the now. Um, the the confusion and what I think is the innocent misunderstanding of what that means is very simple. Whatever I'm doing right now is the most important thing I should be focused on. And if it wouldn't be, then what am I, why am I doing it? Oh, I'm getting dressed right now. Oh, I'm talking to a friend on the phone. I'm not gonna take another click. I'm speaking right now to my spouse. Right now is precious time with my child in their formative years. And if I don't build the rapport necessary while my kids are at home and young, well, guess what? When I wake up realizing I don't have a proper relationship with this child that I'm walking down the aisle to their wedding, well, whose fault is that? I had 18 plus years to nurture that relationship. And now guess what? That kid probably is not even interested in all my overtures to spend time with them because they were trained by me that they're not important in my life, or at least not as important as. Well, not as important as. Oh my gosh, Leia! Scary stuff. <laughs> okay, no. Scary stuff because you want to go. You almost want to like go back in time and like start from the beginning again and do it the right way. But someone on Facebook is actually saying she says the problem is today we're so tied to our phones. Like everything is on our phones. Our appointments, our conversations, what we need to do. I know the phone to me has become so scary. Only even because like I was texting someone the other day. She wanted makeup names of makeup artists and I wrote to her oh you should try this one and you should try this one and you should try this one I gave her like three names and then she's like oh could you get me the phone numbers I'm like sure I'm gonna go look on the Instagram because that's where they post their stuff and I go to Instagram and as I open Instagram the first three posts are from these three people meaning the algorithm in my phone actually is now attuned to picking up that I'm looking for these types of people and they're marketing that to me. So it's like you say something and automatically your phone pops it up, your screen pops it up. Like we're so not attuned to scary. Like, That's yeah, scary. It's, yeah. But, and we're so not there you, anymore and it's just getting worse. So how do you like, how do you go practically? How do you go backwards? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to go. Um, uh, how do you practically go backwards? First of all, it's, let me explain how our brain works. It's not as complicated as it might appear. 
the original word psychology, which has been, um, forgive me for using the language, has been um, corrupted over the last, last century or so. Psychology, you look it up in any dictionary, the word psych actually means soul. Logic is a system of reasoning. The original concept of, and the word psych is a Greek word, and then later on a Latin word, is referring to your soul. That means the people who were studying this believed that there is a divine intelligence that wired our minds, that gives us the power to think, the power to be aware of our thinking, there's, there's somewhere inside of you that's listening to your thinking. And everything you can experience is only possible through thought. And when I say everything, I include your emotions. There are no emotions. They are not separate to your mind. That's why in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, which is God's language, his dictionary, he actually uses the word lev, which unfortunately we only translate as heart, but the word lev actually translates correctly and accurately the vast majority of times as mind and thought. And the reason why we have it meaning both heart, icon of emotions, thought is simply because 100% of all you feel is what you're thinking. You're always feeling your thoughts. Okay, always. wait, wait, we gotta, we gotta make sure we understand this. This is, when you told this to me the other day, I was like, Whoa, like, whoa, this is a meme. You got that line? <laughs> got to make a meme out of this. Oh, okay, so say it again and, and explain what you mean. Okay, here's a thought. It's my hammer thought. I'm not sure if you can read it. Anxiety. <laughs> this is my anxiety. And when, oh, it hurts when I think about the things I'm really anxious, like COVID, yes, vaccine, no vaccine. Uh, I want to travel. I want to see my kids. I don't know, I, I don't, I don't know what's going to be. I have a lot of anxiety. Um, by the way, <laughs> My debt, these are thoughts. Okay. I can't take it. The debt I'm in is driving me mad. How will I ever get out of this debt? I'm so worried about my health issues. I am so worried. My doctor says I'm overweight. I'm a candidate for heart disease again. I got such a slow. I gotta go on a good diet. I have so much frustration in my life. It's another thought. My boss, you know, he drives me crazy. I do the work of three employees. I get paid half of everyone else in this company. He shows me no appreciation. <laughs> I want those hammers. You, you should sell them by the set. <laughs> hey, with, the, with, the, with a little marker that you can write in your own. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> told me, Rabbi, aren't you hurting yourself? They're, they're rubber and they're very, very soft. Okay. Um, so I've got a lot of this stress. There's, here's my anger hammer. Um, this is my spouse. No, no, I'm not literally. I mean, it's when I think about her, right? Okay, so okay. here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is it the traffic that is stressing me out when I get stressed by the traffic? It's a, you have no idea. This commute drives me crazy. It's an hour and a half, two hours each way to Brooklyn from Muncie, where I live. And I've got to do that twice, three times a week. It is so stressful. So here's a question. Why is it that when the passenger next to me is so stimulating, is so interesting, that every red light I am grateful for because now I've got more time. I'm enjoying this so much. Oh, so it's not the car in front that gets into my brain and presses my stress button. That's impossible. It's my thinking about the traffic that's stressing me out. Oh, so the thoughts of my health issues and my boss and my children <laughs> drive me crazy. One hour, one hour of your chutzpah is more than I had in a lifetime to my parents. <laughs> now, there's no one listening who can relate to any of this, but some of you have friends who know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I blame my kids, guess where it starts? Anger is not genesis in an emotion. It starts here, and I will prove it to you. I could be so upset with my spouse right now, or one of my kids, let's say uh, one of my teenagers drives me crazy. You drive me mad, I can't stand. Michael, how are you? Yes, really, <laughs> oh, in five minutes? I'll be there, awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, know where, yeah, bye. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. You don't understand who Michael is. He's a client that has never called me once. I'm chasing him for three months. If I get this deal, 
and close on it, it's, it's going to be like an equivalent to three years of commissions. And he's calling me. I'm in the middle of really being angry, really angry with my teenager. And all of a sudden, how did my mind go to the phone? And when I saw, oh, Michael, hi, Michael, how are you? And I pick up. But what, what happened to my emotion of anger and frustration and outrage? And the answer is very simple. You cannot have two thoughts at the same time. It's impossible. Your mind is brilliant. It will, it will move to one thought to another very fast. But you can't have two thoughts at the same time. Which means, how long is the life of a thought? As long as you think it. Oh, so how far are you ever away from a different thought? And the answer is, you are always one thought away. Michael, I see his number come up. He's never called me once. I'm chasing him. And now he calls and says, can you meet me in five minutes? I really want to close on the deal. Um, I, I'm around the corner, come into my office. And I say, I'll be there in five minutes. Why don't I just say, you have no idea the bad timing. I am so upset with my son right now. I need three weeks of therapy before I can call you back. <laughs> you see, what I'm illustrating is, where do we experience life? It's never outside. It's not my children. If it were my children, and I'm chained to them, <laughs> and I outsource my well-being, I outsource my happiness. This is my happiness. Uh, um, I love I it. <laughs> I outsource my happiness to my children. Only when they're more respectful and loving and giving, then I'll be happy as a parent. And if I do the same thing to my job, I am tied to my job. And when my boss will finally show me some appreciation, I'm going to enjoy my job. And as long as he shows me appreciation, I'm happy in my job. I have sold my happiness and I've outsourced it, but I'm chained. I'm chained to my children. I'm chained to people who I want to please. I'm chained to my spouse. I'm chained to anything outside of me that I think that when that changes, I'll be a more happy person. I have sold my happiness because you cannot ever give your happiness key away. It's impossible. And if you do, then what you're really saying is, please, please open up my happiness for me. Please, please change. Be more loving, be more respectful, more understanding, and then I'll be happy. No, the key to happiness, you can't even give away. The only thing that can happen is you think your happiness is outsourced to something outside of you, that someone controls your happiness. But that's never really true. We're living in a world that is constantly bombarding me with images, but where we experience those images is inside thought. So when you ask, so how do I undo all that stuff and go back to having a free mind? And the answer is your mind is always free because you're always one thought away from a different thought. You are never addicted to phones. And for that matter, no one's addicted to any addictions. And that sounds crazy, but I'm going to share with you a gentleman who I recently uh, was on a video with who'd been through 10 rehabs for heroin. Heroin is a hard drug. Mm -hmm. To get, to survive 10 rehabs, that doesn't make any sense. He should have overdosed a long time ago. And he admitted to the audience that was listening to him on Zoom that the only thing missing in his entire life was a death certificate. Until one day, he had the most amazing insight. And this is what he said. I realized I never had a heroin addiction. Excuse me? Hello? You've been in rehab <laughs> 10 times, and now you're saying you never had a, a heroin addiction? Here was his answer. Amazing. Amazing clarity. I realized that I did not have an addiction problem. I had a thinking problem. I thought this drug would save me from my pain, help me escape from whatever it is I'm trying to escape from. And when I realized that the drug has no hold on me, it's what I think the drug will do for me. I'm not addicted to food. Now, some people say, oh no, that's not true, Rabbi. Well, guess what? I could be making a beeline to my refrigerator as soon as I get home from work, because that's what I do every day when I come home from work. And suddenly I get a call from my best friend. Oh, Sandra, I'm so glad you called. Got so much to catch up. We haven't spoken in 20 minutes. Let me tell you. And all of a sudden, 
you're on the phone for an hour and a half. An hour and a half ago, you were starving. You put the phone down. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I was starving. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> you only experience thirst and hunger in your thought because one distraction can have me not thinking about food for a long time. And then I even have to remind myself, what, what was I doing before this phone call? Oh yeah, I'm hungry, I'm starving, I'm going to the refrigerator. So what I'm bringing out is something so ridiculously simple, that's why it will probably go over my head most of the time. It's ridiculously simple. Psychology is the logic of your soul. God wired your mind to never be able to have two thoughts simultaneously. And that's important to know because now you know the life of a single thought is as long as you think it. And if you don't like the thoughts of anger, stress, anxiety, that are plaguing and knocking and banging and the fear and my boss and my frustration hammer, and if I don't like the thoughts I'm having, how far am I away from a new thought? One thought away, always, without exception. I can distract myself, make a call, open up a book um, that I, of wisdom, of Torah wisdom, for example. I, I can distract myself. I can turn it into a prayer. God, help me with what appears to me to be an addiction, um, but help me to turn myself around and be aware that I go to the refrigerator when I'm not even starving. I'm just, I just want food, but I'm not hungry, hungry. I ate already. So it's only habit that I've created, but the habit is over here. It's not in my mouth. It's not in my saliva. It's in my mind. We are always only experiencing life through thought. And living in the now is nothing more complicated than paying attention to what I'm doing right now, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, with the kids, with my spouse, um, going relaxing at the end of the day and unwinding in order that when I go to sleep, my mind is more calm and there's a bit more subtraction from the craziness of the schedule and the multitasking and the couple and the career and uh, making the meals and clearing up and preparing that project and getting to the deadline and, and all the things that... Oh my gosh, it is hollow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, the, the question, it, it's, it, you know, you had said in our pre-show, you said that you don't have to have think thoughts that are hurting you, which is what you're saying with all those hammers, okay? So the question is, though, it, it's kind of like, um, let's say you, you, it was your day and that day, the boss, you know, you're at a staff meeting and you say, oh, I have a great idea. Da, da, da. And then the boss says, mm, no, no. Why don't you go? I don't think you had enough coffee this morning. <laughs> and everybody laughs. So if, if my definition of happiness is that my boss has to be approving, appreciative and, and never, um, dismissive, um, who have I defined as controlling my happiness in my job? If it's my spouse who always, without almost exception, has to be supportive, loving, affectionate, giving, listening, empathic, well, guess what I've done? I've defined my happiness in this marriage, and you have the key to my happiness. Why would I give my key to my happiness away? What's the alternative, though? I mean, the boss really did that. The boss did that. The alternative is, what do I now think? Do I want to think I'm embarrassed? I'm ashamed? I will never open my mouth again. I think it's a brilliant idea and he hasn't even listened to all the reasons why. Um, I, I can think anything I want to think, but if I want to think he doesn't appreciate me, I'm embarrassed. I'm, I, I, you know, maybe I should look for another job. So those are possibilities too, but no one's forcing me to think that. And, and, and the more I realize nobody ever can put a feeling inside of me, it's impossible. And even if I give them permission to bully, intimidate, and make me feel um, I'm stupid or not very smart with that suggestion at that, at that meeting. Um, it doesn't change the real facts that you only experience life through here and you're always one thought away from changing your uh, thinking. What's the one thought away? The one thought away is he's an idiot. <laughs> you know, the one thought, what's the one thought away? I, I, I'll me? give you an example. Okay. Um, I, uh, he didn't even listen to the reasons behind, which means he has actually not rejected my idea. Um, so I'm going to wait for a better time to represent it so that he can actually hear what's behind the reasoning and then 
understand the value, the added value to his company by at least exploring my idea, even if he doesn't agree with it straight away, at least explore it. But I've got to help him convince himself. I'm not here to convince you. In fact, I'm not here to convince anybody. The only person God put me in this world to change was myself. And if I think I'm going to change my teenager, <laughs> or if I think I'm going to change my mother-in-law, oh yeah. Right. Sorry, I was just, I was just um, swallowing. <laughs> we have so many things coming in. He had, he had a delay in the audio over there. Mother. In law, yes. Um, <laughs> okay. have, by the way, on Facebook, um, Rabbi Reddy, we have so many comments and 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 likes and loves. And someone's writing. He's so engaging, intellectual. I really think it also has to do with your accent because I just find that people. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really sorry. I was born that way. <laughs> um, okay, so this person is writing. Someone is writing that. Um, it actually, that's what they love about Shabbos because there's no distraction. And how do they sort of create that, like that Shabbos? How do they create that in their day, in their daily routine when things are, you know, when we are connected so much? And they also said, because I have to say this, I think Robert already you need to start making your props as like, you have to sell them because we have someone saying, I need a frustration hammer. Another person says, I need that key in caps. So <laughs> I'm sure someone else wants the tie. I mean, we're basically, <laughs> everything is coming off. He's merchandising. I thought he was yeah. anti merchandising, but his, meanwhile, he's merchandising. Okay, we get it. It's <laughs> very funny. Yeah, it's cute. So, so the question on the table now, Rabbi, is what was the question? On the how, do you, how do you create a Shabbos yeah, environment yeah. in your daily life? Like, how do you create a shutdown time? Excellent. You know, when, when, when a person's keeping Shabbos, there's an admission that God controls the world because it carries on without me having to go to work, without me driving, without me being involved in all the different devices, electrics, etc., And of course, the obvious room that's now vacated to make room for is time for myself, time for my spouse, for my immediate family, for community, praying together, singing songs of praise to our creator, um, having festive meals. So all that creates a conducive environment for the mind to be freed of thinking, work, 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 debt, um, catch up with the clients, appointments. And, and Shabbos literally, literally becomes an island of sanity. Now, your question is, so how can I create more islands of sanity during the week? And I think the, the, the place we need to begin is in recognizing just the awareness that you are never a slave to anything or anyone unless you think you are, and even if you think you are, that doesn't make you a slave. It just means that until you have let go of that innocent misunderstanding, you think you're a slave, but you always have options. I'm gonna give you one of the most extreme examples of where trauma is taking place, always over here. Uh, it was a question I asked to a Dr. Keith Blevins, this is in your mind. I'm sorry, for our podcast listeners. Yeah. I, they oh, so it's between your, your ears. In other yeah. words, yeah. the mind. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, so Dr. Keith Blevins was head of trauma in Miami Beach Hospital for, for I think, close to three decades. Um, he's still a practicing psychologist He's and psychiatrist. He's, he's retired, but he has his own private practice. But he's completely devoted to the concept that human beings are created by a divine intelligence that gives them the ability to heal themselves inside their mind. This, is, this may sound revolutionary, especially that Dr. Freud um, popularized analytical psychology, meaning um, his basic premise was you cannot be mentally healthy unless you have delved into how your parents functioned, dysfunctioned siblings, your father, your mother, your, even your grandparents, and analyze and understand that. Because without understanding uh, what a mess they made of their parenting or, or the spousing or uh, sibling rivalry, etc., how can you possibly move forward in life 
um, if you're carrying all that baggage with you. And what God is essentially saying is, but I didn't create you that way. I created you that you only experience life over here. So if you're traumatized by what happened yesterday, whether yesterday was years ago, decades, decades ago, physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, intimidation, bullying, whatever it is, today it's a memory. A memory can't kill you. I can get triggered into anxiety, fear, worry, low self-esteem by thinking about that. So I asked Dr. Blevins, what was the most extreme example where he saw someone in trauma um, in his experience working in a trauma department in Miami Beach Hospital, um, where the, it was the most extreme example of a human being showing the resilience God gave us. And he immediately told the audience, I was, I was asking the question from the audience, the most extreme example was a young lady in her thirties who was brought into hospital very in the early hours of the morning, unconscious. Yeah, she had yeah. been horribly abused. Mm -hmm. um, they had to operate on her and she, she was left with over 300 stitches. The protocol he explained in hospital is that when someone comes out of, of um, surgery into recovery, at the earliest and most appropriate time, which they deem is, is appropriate, um, the head of trauma introduces himself to the, the, the person in recovery. And he introduced himself. My name is Dr. Keith Blevins. I'm here with my team and I'm head of a trauma. I just want you to know that whenever you're ready, we're here uh, to talk and, and discuss what you've been through. Um, and he said to us, her answer blew his mind. Her answer was the following. Oh, that's okay. Um, my body was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but my mind is undamaged. Now, he assumed that she's in just complete denial and hasn't, hasn't had a moment to properly process what she's been through. And the trauma is going to surface. And she was in rehab for several months because of the injuries that was adjacent. The rehab was adjacent to the hospital. So she, she was his case study for three months, never changed the script. Same story. And wow. This, this is not denial of pain. It's the reality of where we experience pain and how we deal with it. You ask, there's almost no survivors left today of the Holocaust, very, very few, but ask any children or survivors of, any children of survivors, um, did your father, mother go around um, all day or many times a day complaining about the third wife, the Nazis ruined my life, all my money's gone, then they killed all my family. And you know what's so amazing? Not only did they not talk about it with their children, they didn't even talk about it with their spouse who themselves was in the camps. They had mm -hmm. nightmares at night. They couldn't control where their mind went. And sometimes they would joke in the morning, which camp were you in last night? Because of the screams that they had. <laughs> when you asked them, why yeah. didn't you talk about it? And you're, you're going to hear the two most frequent answers blows your mind. Number one, this is the most amazing answer, I think. I was too busy rebooting my life, starting my life again. I was too busy focusing on getting married, building marriage, building family, building community, building schools, be building yeshivas. I was, I was busy in my business, building the business to support my family. Their mind shut out yesterday and I live today because that's the only day I've got. It's the only day you and I ever have because yesterday is history gone. In the language of the Talmud, ma dahaba haba, what happened, happened. Our most famous commentator on the Talmud, Rashi, Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki was his name. He said, ma nitzrach lishol alav. What do I need to ask questions about yesterday? Move on. People who are mentally healthy, and that's every single person when they recognize where does mental health take place? And the answer is your next thought. You're never stuck with anger or frustration, or I don't have to be there doing this to myself. I'm gonna give you a very simple analogy. You've got a beautiful mind. It's created by the creator. Your mind is like a gorgeous garden. And in your garden, you've got people who love you and are part of your life, your family, immediate family, extended family. 
you know, I can't resist this one. Someone asked me for my definition of a dysfunctional family. I said, look, that's really easy. The definition of a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one member. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Here, here you have a beautiful mind. Your mind has a lot of memories, vacations, family time, uh, achievements, accomplishments, what you've done, things that you're happy for. And um, you're taking a walk in your garden and amongst the beautiful flowers growing there, oh my gosh, there's a weed. I know what to do. So I go into my house, I get a flask of water and I pour it on top of the weed. Is that logical or is that ill logical? <laughs> that makes no sense. Now, tomorrow I come into my beautiful garden. Oh no, this weed has grown bigger and higher and there's more <laughs> around it. I go into my house, get more water, pour it onto the weeds. Why am I watering the weeds? Watering the weeds. And I come back next week um, for another session, I water the weeds. Excuse me, that's not logical, that's illogical. And what's gonna happen to my beautiful garden if I stay focused enough on the weeds? What's gonna happen to my beautiful garden? Weeds everywhere. Yeah, weeds it's gonna be everywhere. overrun with weeds. <laughs> it will be, the garden will become disrepair, be neglected, and eventually the weeds will take over. Our mind is our garden. And when we water the weeds, I'm not talking about mm. negative thinking. I'm talking about thinking. I'm talking about the nature of thought. I'm talking about the way God wired our mind. You are always one thought away from realizing this key to my happiness is always here. There is no happiness outside of you. And the moment I say, you have the key to my happiness, what am I doing selling it to you? Now, if I take joy in things that happen outside of me, you're adding to your intrinsic happiness, but your real happiness has to be inside, innate, intrinsic. Because if it isn't, then I've made it hanging on something outside of me, chained to that item, whether it's my job, and now I'll only be happy if I move to another job. And before you know it, we have a whole society that's actually glorifying the statement the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit. Oh, that means happiness is always outside of my reach, but I'll come in. I can never reach it. Do you know why? Because I'm in constant pursuit. And as soon, as soon as I've tried that beautiful new model car, I love it. I feel really good and cool until the next model comes out. If I attach my happiness to my body, then my body shape is what's making me or not making me happy. That's ridiculous. And now what happens is because I've outsourced my well-being, my innate health, my happiness to many people and circumstances outside of me, it has cluttered my mind with so many thoughts of what has to happen for me to enjoy my family, my work, my career, my life, my, my time out uh, without distress. I've got so many conditions that in the end, my mind gets so cluttered and I don't have the peace of mind to see the solution. And the solution is always extremely simple because it's always in here. It can never be outside. And so that's I why you find people, they go, to the, they go in the bath and in the shower, they're singing. And they're not thinking about their problems. But that is enough of a downtime to relax the mind. It's in psychology, they have an expression. It's called the law of subtraction. And in Judaism, it's, it's much more powerful because when I let go of resentment, anger, when I let go of arrogance and resentment, bitterness, when I let go of hatred, now the mind is being vacated by all the stuff that is cluttering me. And in the law of subtraction, what, uh, what's left is a free mind, Shabbos, where I can now focus on what matters the most my sanity, my growth, my spouse, her, his needs, children, their needs, listening, eye contact, spending time with each other, playing games, learning together. Oh, 
And all that gets constantly distracted by yours truly. That's fantastic. Okay, before we, I'm going to tell people, we've got a couple of minutes. I, before, um, I want to tell people how to reach you and how you have an amazing thing called a career in happiness. It's an audio tape that I'm going to tell people how to get to. But I first want to, I just want one final, ex- maybe a couple of examples on, I love this thing, you're one thought away. So if I'm sitting there and like, oh, this thing's bothering me, that one, and da, 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 how do I describe for us the transition how the step-by-step how do you make that transition and and you've got like standing on one foot (laughs) okay the transition is a very simple one can the traffic stress me out or is it my thinking about the traffic can my spouse really ruin my life or is it my thinking about how i've given the best years of my life to this person (laughs) he's taken my life away Oh, it's my thinking about it that's traumatizing me. And it's not, it's not the food and it's not COVID. It's nothing that's outside of me. The awareness alone of the true mm-hmm. genesis. In the mind. I have to think about it to feel it. So if I'm, God gave us the emotion of anger so that I would know what I'm thinking. But the trap I fall into is thinking, you make me angry. That's impossible. If I absolutely knew that I would get $250,000 wired into my city bank account every time you provoke me to my anger and I refuse to get angry, do you think it's really going to be that hard? Mm -hmm. It's taking place over here. That's where we are experiencing our emotions. So the, the closing line is focus on What's the true source of my feelings? Is it coming from outside in because it appears that way? Or do I have to think about it to feel it? And once you know the answer to that, that's where the shift starts happening. It's a very short shift. And once you learn that experience, it's not an academic intellectual learning. Once you experience, oh my gosh, I'm experiencing my anger because I'm thinking angry thoughts. I'm experiencing resentment because I'm thinking thoughts of resentment. So I feel resentful and frustrated. Once I have, once I understand that that's the true genesis and your provocation is just an invitation via God to give me another chance to explore where where am I experiencing life in its its reality? The answer is always the same place. In which case, all of a sudden, there's a chance of true liberation, freedom. Because as long as I'm chained my happiness to anything outside of me, my mind is so cluttered and I just don't know how I can get out of this trap. I'll turn to food, I'll turn to drugs, I'll turn to smoking, I'll turn to drinking. They don't help. It's just my thinking that they're going to help me escape from my stuff. That's the problem. Not the alcohol, not the addictions. It's my thinking that they're going to help me and they don't. They make it worse in the end. Yeah, gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah, we've ne- no joke. I, I, I've, I've never seen so many hearts and stuff floating on Instagram. And health coach Sarah said, powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And that's coming from a health coach. That's really good. Right? <laughs> that's good. Okay. So the way you can get in touch with Rabbi Rietti and it's, it's Jonathan Rietti, Rabbi Jonathan Rietti, R I E T T I. And you can go to Amazon and just type that in and you'll come up with a thing called a career in happiness. I've listened to it myself. Well, started it myself. I, it's a, it's a game changer in terms of happiness. I'm loving it. I'm really loving it. I have a bunch of friends that are also doing it. It's called a career in happiness. Oh, you can, either go to jewishinspiration.com you could also get it there or you can go to amazon and it's called a career in happiness it's an audio tape but he's got lots of books there go scrolling through his books and his audio tapes on his website you you can't believe how much stuff is there and all of it with a sense of humor Rabbi, uh, uh, if, if i may i just let you know if there's anyone here who wants to learn more about what i'm describing here uh there's an organization that comes out of london called i heart i h e a r t iHeart.org. Um, they're actually uh, Bali Teshuva um, from Johannesburg, uh, Terry and Brian Rubenstein. They're creating a revolution in building children's resilience to difficulty <laughs> by recognizing the fact of where we experience life. Very powerful. I highly recommend it. And one wow. book I wrote on the subject is called All Midot, which is the Hebrew term for character. All character traits begin with a thought. 
So that's, Wait, hold it up closer to the screen. All Midos begins with a thought. Oh, excellent. It looks fantastic. Okay, yeah. by Jonathan Rietti. Okay, thank you so much for being on this. This is so packed with great stuff. We're all going to walk away different human beings. Thank you so much for being on the show. Okay, really and I hope you got the jokes. Yes, <laughs> we got them. We got them. And my staff over here are all laughing. They're going, yeah. It was great. Thanks a million, Rabbi. Okay, God bless you all. Thank you. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. We'll see you next time.